I want to welcome everyone. I'm, I'm delighted to be here to introduce the Tanner Lecture Series on Ethics, Citizenship, and Public Responsibility, and Michelle Alexander. Before we start, if you've not already done so, please take a minute to silence your phones. On behalf of the university, I want to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands we now sit. My name is Grant Reher. I'm the director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute at the Maxwell School of Syracuse University, which organizes the Tanner Lecture Series. And we have many thanks to give, and for reasons of time, I can only mention a few of them. But first of all, I wanna thank all of you for being here. It's, it, it's great to see all of you, and it's great to see so many students. I also want to acknowledge our alums and our friends who are watching through the live stream, and I wanna give a special shout out to the veterans and politics program, uh, if those folks are watching. I wanna thank the Dean's office and our Dean, David Van Slyke, who unfortunately could not be here this evening, he's traveling, but I wanna thank him and his office for supporting the lecture series. For technical support, I want to thank the Information and Computing Technology Group, and in particular, Tom Fazio and Matt Coulter. Thanks as well to Kelly Coleman and Jackie Nachevsky, who work in the Campbell Institute and help put together these events. And for this event, especially Jackie Nachevsky, and I'm gonna take um, uh, the, the introducer's prerogative, I guess, and also say that Kelly Coleman, uh, who works in the Institute, is celebrating a birthday today, and she, uh, 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 gave me permission to put a number on it because it's a big one. Uh, she's 60 today, so so if you see her out there, congratulations. So regarding our format, uh, I'll make a brief introduction to, to the lecture series and then to Michelle Alexander. And, and then the two of us will engage in a conversation and that will be followed by a broader conversation with those of us who are gathered here together in this room. And for the Q&A, we'll have two microphones that I believe there will be two folks um, who will get those to you once you've been recognized by me. So please raise your hand in order to be recognized. And when you get the microphone, I'm gonna ask the usual three things that I always ask of folks in this room when we have these events. And that is first of all, speak into the microphone so that everyone can hear you and also that, so that you're part of our recording and the folks online uh, will be able to hear you. Be brief, and then once you're done with your question or your comment, give the microphone back to the person who handed it to you. At the conclusion of the program, we're gonna have a reception outside. There'll be food and drink, and Michelle Alexander will be available uh, for a limited time to continue the conversation. We also have her book, The New Jim Crow, available for sale, and um, uh, maybe you can try to get her to sign it uh, if, you can, if you can find her through the crowd of folks that are gonna be uh, obviously wanting to speak to her. But she, she's, she's uh, willing to do that, and we're grateful for that. So um, let me say a few words about the primary donor and sponsor of this event, Lynn Tanner, and also the Tanner Lecture Series. Lynn Tanner is a Maxwell PhD. He's the founder and executive chair of Tech Canada, which is an enterprise which generates ideas and social capital among corporate leaders. Lynn's life and career have been concerned with the joining of both theory and practice and posing challenges to commonly held distinctions between the public and the private sectors. And the intention of these lectures is to ask urgent questions about ethical citizenship, public responsibility, and mutual civic obligations. I wanna thank Lynn and his spouse, Margaret, for their vision and for their generosity in making the lectures possible. Now, unfortunately, Lynn could not be here with us today, but we can always express our appreciation to him because I know he's watching us on the live stream and his family. So thank you, Lynn, and your family for the leadership. For today. One last thing about Lynn and the lecture series is that one of the aims of the series is to draw on citizens who have engaged in generative activity in different arenas, both in the private and the public sector, and who have in turn directed that activities in ways that both, both stimulate and, and challenge our citizenship. And in that regard, I really cannot think of a better example of that vision than Michelle Alexander. And I, I said at the outset um, that I was delighted to be here 
to introduce the lecture series and her. But I want to say that actually my feelings are a little bit more complicated than that because this is my final year as director of the Campbell Institute, and therefore it's my final time introducing this lecture. So it's a little bittersweet for me here, standing up here. But 15 years is a long time. It was a good run, and it's time to hand the baton off to somebody else. But what a way to go out with this crowd and with this speaker. I can't, I, 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 I can't think of a better last lecture. So. And I don't have, I don't have any bittersweet feelings about being able to introduce Michelle Alexander. Um, those are all sweet. It's, it's rare that a single book has the kind of profound impact on public awareness, public discussion, political movements, policy discussions, art, and philanthropic efforts that the new Jim Crow has had. It's also been exceptionally commercially successful, spending nearly five years, five years on the New York Times bestseller list. Indeed, Cornel West has called it the secular Bible for a new social movement, an instant, and I would add now, enduring classic that captures the emerging spirit of our age. But Michelle Alexander is a lot more than this foundational book, even though that alone would be more than enough for one life. She's worn many hats and she's worn all of them exceptionally well. I won't repeat all the awards and recognitions that she and her book have received in her professional life, but they're many and they're striking. But she has been a professor at a number of universities, including Stanford and Ohio State. She clerked for a Supreme Court Justice, Harry A. Blackman. She has been a civil rights advocate and litigator in both the private and nonprofit sectors. She's been a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, and she's been a commentator for CNN, MSNBC, and NPR. So obviously, she's in great demand as a speaker and she often must turn down the many invitations that she gets. And that she is speaking for the first time in the Tanner series does not mean that this is the first time I have invited her to speak. Um, we had a wonderful lunch today uh, earlier, and uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Samaj who said the third time was the charm. She was talking about something else, but the third time was the charm for this invitation, and I'm glad it worked. Uh, so it's a great thrill. Uh, I'm nothing if not persistent. So it's, it's a great thrill on a, on a number of levels for me to welcome her here. Uh, it really is. And so, uh, Michelle Alexander, welcome to the Maxwell School. We're so glad you could be here. So now this is going to be a bit artificial, but I'm going to go over here and sit down. We're going to have a chat. <laughs> so, and then we'll, we'll invite others into the chat. So, uh, I wanted to start with a couple of things from your book and then sort of see what your thoughts are about what's happened since, since then, since the original publication of it. And it, it's had a 10 year edition, but I'm, I wanna go back to the original publication of it. And you wrote in the preface to your book that the book was intended for people who care deeply about racial justice, but who do not yet appreciate the magnitude of the crisis faced by communities of color as a result of mass incarceration, and for people who are trying to persuade others about the depth and the importance of the problem. So my question for you to start with is, do you think looking back then and fast forward to today, that since the original publication date, do you think a lot more people have more fully appreciated these inequities in the criminal justice system? Well, yes and no. Nice. Um, you know, first, I want to thank you all for having me. I'm very glad to be here, and I don't do a lot of public speaking anymore, so um, that's why I said no a couple of times. But, um, you know, it was absolutely my greatest hope and prayer in writing the book that I would help to make visible um, a human rights nightmare that was occurring on our watch and that so many of us within the civil rights community had either been blind to or silent about. And to say that we had been blind and silent isn't to say that everyone had been. Mm -hmm. There were organizers, there were activists, there were abolitionists that were trying to get the 
attention um, of the public, but were generally dismissed in the introduction of that original version. I talk about how people often kind of met this notion mm -hmm. that um, black people were being relegated to a second class status um, with laughter, that they were, you know, and they were labeled as radical, extreme, delusional. And I'll say that, you know, when I decided to write my book at the time, I had just finished working as a litigator at the ACLU directing the Racial Justice Project. And we had been kind of waging a broad-based campaign against racial profiling by the police. And I had been hired at Stanford Law School. I was directing their civil rights clinics and decided that I really needed to write a book um, that could be used as a tool and hopefully sound an alarm. And the idea of the book was met with a lot of resistance and even laughter. Um, many people said, oh, you know, why don't you wait till you get tenure before you start writing nonsense like that? Um, who's going to believe that a racial caste system now exists in America? Um, you know, in many ways, we were living in a different world at the time I was researching and writing the book. And it really was an era in which many in the civil rights community was intoxicated by this idea that we are entering into an era of color blindness and that color blindness was the goal and that we are making progress towards that goal. And so my thesis that uh, not only we were not entering into an era of color blindness, but a system of racial and social control, a virtual caste-like system had been born again in America, um, was treated as not just radical, um, but a little ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up leaving Stanford um, because I didn't feel like I had the support um, within the faculty in order to write the book I felt I needed to write and went to Ohio State University um, and joined the Kerwin Institute there, which was then led by John Powell, that was supportive of the book. And, you know, when the book was released, um, it was met with mostly a deafening silence. You know, a lot of people imagine, oh, it became this big bestseller, but that's not the case for, it took two years after the publication of the book to reach the bestseller list. There were two years where I was talking to small crowds of activists and community groups and in church basements and um, trying to kind of sound the alarm. But you know, Barack Obama had just been elected as our nation's first black president. And so our nation was sort of awash in this post-racialism and we shall overcome. Um, and so it was, wasn't until two years um, after the book was released that mm. thanks to a grassroots movement of um, an organizing effort of, you know, really folks who had been working, particularly around folks who were locked up, locked out, dealing with police violence, as well as a lot of activists who were working around educational um, in equity, who kind of took up the book as a vehicle for helping to explain to people in the community um, why educational inequity uh, could never be solved as long as kids' parents and uncles and aunts were cycling in and out of the system. And so I am enormously grateful um, for that grassroots work that finally helped to push the message of the book into the mainstream. And yeah, the fact that it made bestseller lists and became part of a national conversation about race and our criminal injustice system was a goal of the book. And I'm grateful for that. Um, but judging by results, um, 
you know, the system of mass incarceration continues to thrive as we speak. Um, it's continued to morph and change, and while enormous progress has been made, particularly around drug policy reform, legalizing um, marijuana, reducing some of the harsh mandatory minimum sentences for people who are convicted of nonviolent um, drug offenses, um, Overall, um, the system continues to function very well, and as maybe we can discuss, you know, it has morphed already so that we now have the rise of digital prisons that didn't exist in the same way um, when I began writing the book more than a decade ago. And um, the punitiveness, uh, you know, that is at the heart of the system, you can see is rising again, not only in our culture and in white nationalism, but there is a, another iteration of kind of the law on order and, you know, get tough movement that um, is emerging again. And so I do think there's broader awareness, um, not due just to my book, but to enormous amounts of organizing, movement building, um, the Black Lives Matter um, movements, um, and the work of abolitionists um, have helped to change the public conversation in really deeply important ways. And yet, here we are um, with a system that functions about as well um, as it did uh, you know, when the book was first written. Well, tell me a little bit more about, tell us a little bit more about the morphing that worries you the most than when you were, you alluded to. Well, it's interesting because when I was first writing the book, I even kind of gestured towards the end that I knew that even if progress was made in terms of, you know, reducing harsh sentencing and, um, you know, already the writing was on the wall that some progress was being made in terms of drug policy reform, that unless we reckoned with our racial history and unless we really confronted the politics of white supremacy that exists in the United States, that any reforms that were achieved um, would ultimately um, be lost as the system shape shifts and morphs over time. And I said, I, at that time, I didn't know what that morphing might be, what it might look like. But now it just seems obvious because in you know the years since I wrote that book, private prisons, for example, um, you know the big private prison companies that have been pouring millions of dollars into you know building new you know brick and mortar institutions um, to lock up people for profit. Um, in the wake of the kind of new public sentiment. Um, around you know decarceration or you know at least the embrace of some reforms began shifting to a model of investing not so much in brick and mortar prisons private prisons but investing in electronic monitoring mm. so many of these private prison companies are now pouring millions of dollars um, into creating you know ever more sophisticated forms of surveillance and monitoring of people and you know many reformers have embraced electronic monitoring as a positive step forward and you know who could deny <laughs> that spending eight years in a literal cage or eight years on a monitor if you have that choice you'd probably choose having an electronic monitor slapped on your ankle or on your wrist um, but what this has meant uh, in practice is that many judges who you know might balk at sentencing someone to five years in prison for some very minor offense have no difficulty putting someone, you know, for double that amount of time on an electronic monitor. And these electronic monitors aren't just inconvenient. <laughs> it's not just a matter of, oh, you know, uh, I can be tracked wherever I go. Um, the reality is, is that many people through these monitoring systems are confined either to their home, like they literally are on house arrest and can't move. Sometimes they're confined to their building, sometimes to their block or to their neighborhood. It makes it very difficult. Sometimes they're prevented from taking their children to school, picking their children up, prevented from obtaining work outside of a very small zone. Um, and 
very often these monitors, you know, malfunction. Um, and so if you step outside your line, <laughs> your cage, your digital invisible cage, if you step outside of it, or if your, you know, thing mal malfunctions, the police can come after you um, and take you right back to, to jail. And uh, this makes it very difficult for people to function. They live in a state of constant fear that anything that they might do, a wrong step or even a malfunction, could send the police coming um, to their door in a potential life-threatening experience. But even beyond that, on kind of a macro level, what we are doing are building giant digital prisons where hmm. you know the kind of racial segregation and the economic segregation um, that is accomplished by physical prisons and jails um, are now being replicated in these kind of open air digital prisons that are controlling, confining, and surveilling the same population, sometimes for longer periods of time um, for Profit, um, and uh, you know, I think we risk actually the expansion <laughs> of um, the carceral state under this digital model, uh, even as it's celebrated in some quarters as being, um, you know, an example of progressive reform. And uh, again, I want to underscore that for people who have a choice of being in a literal cage or being on a monitor, um, yeah, it, I would choose it. Um, and yet I think imagining that what we're actually doing by embracing these reforms uh, is ending the system of mass incarceration, I, I say no, it's, mm. it's a newer um, Jim Crow and still functions a caste-like system. Um, and I think we've also seen, um, you know, since the book was written, the way in which mass deportation um, functions in the United States um, in ways that are very similar. Um, the experience of folks who have been labeled criminals and felons are remarkably similar to the experiences of those who are undocumented and are under either surveillance, constant threat of deportation, have difficulty working legally, um, and are you know subject to a permanent sec second class status and live in a constant state of fear that their um, you know either could be deported, incarcerated, risk losing their families, their children, et cetera. And so I think the relationship between the systems of mass incarceration and the systems of mass deportation are being explored now by more by scholars and activists, and it's something that I didn't take up in my book, but if I were to write it all over again, I think I would be um, exploring the relationships between mass incarceration and mass deportation in much more depth. Are there other changes that have been put forward as reforms that you have concerns about other than these two that you did, the one in particular that you talked about? As potentially problematic yeah, reforms? Yes, potentially problematic. Well, you know, I, I would say that I'm very much concerned about all reform work that imagines that it will fix the system. Hmm. So I, I do not see, you know, I, I think some reform work is important and necessary in order to ease the suffering of the people who are in prison, the people who are, and the family members who are um, trapped within the system. Um, all reforms that reduce the amount of time that people spend behind bars um, are important. But I think this idea that this system is basically fine, but a little bit too discriminatory and a little bit too harsh, and if only it affected people more equally and was a little bit less harsh, it would be fine. Um, is a fundamentally flawed way of thinking about the system as a whole. So I, you know, I, I 
I, for that reason, I understand why people have poured a lot of time into, for example, the progressive prosecutors movement, like trying to elect progressive prosecutors. Mm -hmm. That can actually make a difference sometimes, not always, sometimes in reducing the amount of time people spend behind bars, particularly for relatively minor nonviolent offenses. But imagining that we're actually going to fix this system um, by electing progressive prosecutors, I think reflects a fundamental misunderstanding, which is that this system that we've created of mass incarceration has relatively little to do with solving the problem of harm that is created either by violence or other offenses and is instead designed to manage and control the dispossessed. And once you come to see that that is actually the purpose of the system that is designed to manage and control the dispossessed rather than to solve real problems of harm created by violence or drug abuse or anything else, I think then you have to begin asking yourself, what would it look like actually to create systems and approaching approaches for responding to harm. And I think this model, this idea that we can respond, we can solve and respond meaningfully to the problem of drug abuse and drug addiction by locking people in cages, but maybe for just a little less time, is fundamentally misguided. I think it's equally misguided to think that that's how we solve the problem of violence in our communities, mm -hmm. is that by locking people up, trapping them in cages for long periods of time, that we're gonna solve the problems of chronic violence that exists in some communities that are violent precisely because those, you know, suffer from high rates of crime and violence precisely because, not because they haven't had enough police and jails, but because they haven't had enough investment, they haven't had enough access to quality education, to quality mental health care, to quality health care of any kind, you know, and on and on. And, you know, the fact that we have relatively low rates of violence and crime in communities that are very well resourced, um, but it's, you know, relatively high rates of crime and violence in communities in which there's been massive di disinvestment, high rates of segregation, um, and ab abandonment um, economically and socially, we can see that it's not more police, more cops, more jails that are gonna solve that problem, um, but it's actually responding with care and concern um, and investing in education and healthcare, um, forms of mutual aid um, that will allow these communities to thrive. It's not rocket science. Everybody kind of knows this already. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we continue to imagine that um, problems of crime and violence can simply be solved really through military action, right? Through um, declaring war on communities and placing them under um, you know, ever greater forms of control. I want to, at some point later in our conversation to look ahead and talk about some of the things that you're thinking about working, you know, that you're working on now. And I can see how those are connected as you're talking, but you did mention something earlier I obviously wanted to ask you about. You mentioned the Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. movement. So I, I wanted to get your thoughts about that. First of all, um, were you surprised at all by how quickly and widely it spread? Well, to some extent, yes. I mean, again, when I was working as a civil rights lawyer at the ACLU in the late 1990s and early 2000s, when, you know, law and order and get tough and the war on drugs was all the rage, um, and it was difficult even to get people within the civil rights community to pay much attention to these issues. Um, the black Congressional Black Caucus wasn't willing to pay attention to these issues. The idea that there could be a global movement in which people were you know, raising signs saying Black Lives Matter in response to police killings was you know, 
beyond mm -hmm. my imagination. And so, you know, it was an extraordinary um, thing to say, see. And it, it, it's been equally extraordinary to see the way in which abolition has moved from the margins much more to the mainstream. And, you know, I think that the contributions of the abolitionists have been equally important as the contributions of those who have been organizing um, kind of under the banner of Black Lives Matter. And obviously there's a lot of overlap um, between the two, but I think for both movements, you know, they have been challenging us uh, to kind of reconsider some of the basic organizing paradigms of our society. And uh, simply by uttering the words Black Lives Matter, um, it became possible to make visible the ways in which black lives have not mattered, not only you know, at the hands of police, but in a wide range of other institutions. And I think you know, the work of abolitionists has been enormously important because it has challenged people to ask themselves, you know, do police do more harm than good? Um, would our world be better off? Is it even possible to imagine a world without prisons? Um, what is actually accomplished um, by locking up two million people um, in cages in this country? It has, you know, challenged our, uh, you know, capacity for imagining alternative ways of responding to harm. And, um, you know, I have been enormously encouraged by so much of the work that has emerged from you know, those movements, even though we still do find ourselves um, with uh, prison industrial complex, a system of mass incarceration that remains about as entrenched as it was before. Mm. Do, you, do you think there have been any downsides to the movement at all? Anything that, that, that concerns you? When you when well, I mean, obviously the, these movements have provoked extraordinary backlash mm. <laughs> and that's inherent, right? There, all movements for racial justice and that have challenged, um, you know, American militarism in any form. And I think it is important to see the police state in the United States as an expression of militarism. Um, these movements have always met um, powerful backlash. And uh, so, yeah, you, we can look at um, the kind of the rise of white nationalism and Trumpism and all that we have seen, um, you know, emerging over the last, you know, more than decade and see that it has been in part a response um, to the success of these movements and the gains that have been made. And so I wouldn't necessarily describe it as a downside. I would describe it as an inevitable consequence. Mm. Um, and, you know, one that we should continue to expect <laughs> as we build movements um, for racial, social, and economic gender justice in the United States, there will always be the backlash and becoming better prepared for it and anticipating it to the best we can, I think is important in our movement buildings. And so I guess I wouldn't think of it in terms of downsides as much as I would think of it in terms of challenges and limitations of these movements, right? And um, among the challenges, um, is the fact that the movements that have emerged have been largely decentralized and um, have not had kind of the clear, visible leadership structures of some other movements. And in many ways, this has been an enormous um, benefit in these movements. And yet there are also limitations. So, you know, I often point out that when kind of the movements to end the old Jim Crow were at their 
peak, you know, we had several national membership-based grassroots organizations that were focused like a laser on ending the old Jim Crow. Um, you had the NAACP, you had Southern Christian Leadership Council, you had, you know, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, you had CORE, Congress on Racial Equality. You know, some of those organizations now, in retrospect, are viewed as kind of like mainstream, not, you know, organizations but at the time, they were viewed you know, often as very kind of radical, or at least organizations that were challenging um, you know, the, the basic structure and design of our system. And these were national membership organi organizations, grassroots-based organizations that had clear goals <laughs> um, and invested an enormous amount of time, energy, resources, and training people to accomplish the goal of dismantling the legal system of Jim Crow. And today, you know, we, we don't have anything equivalent in, to challenge the system of mass incarceration in the United States. Now, you could argue that's a good thing. Um, you know, the, the downsides of charismatic leadership that <laughs> dominated those movements um, and uh, the flexibility and creativity that's possible within decentralized movements is highly important. Um, but uh, I think we also don't have the kind of political strength um, that would be required to dismantle a system like mass incarceration um, that would be achieved if the movements were more organized. Um, and so I, this isn't so much an argument for, oh, we should reboot the civil rights <laughs> organizations of the past or that kind of movement or leadership structure. I don't, but I think we do have challenges to work through. Um, if we are serious about ending the system of mass incarceration, which is so deeply entrenched um, in our legal system, in our political, economic, and social system, uh, I think we're gonna have to have a profound shift in consciousness, um, which would you know, mean having an awakening to the dignity and humanity of those who are trapped within the system, but we would also need to develop methods and forms of organizing and movement building that have the capacity to really shake the foundations of the system. And I don't have uh, a blueprint for that. Um, and like I said, I think so much of the work that both has been done sort of under the Black Lives Matter banner and as well as by so many abolitionists today has been essential in moving us um, towards those goals. Uh, but we're going to need a profound paradigm shift in the United States if we are ever going to undo the system of mass incarceration that we have created and not birth something new to replace it. Mm -hmm. Well, this next question kind of, it pushes on that a little bit, and I'm, I'm, I'll try to be as clear as I can, but you've, you've, you've tracked very eloquently, the, the, uh, traced a line between the concerns about mass incarceration um, and the original concerns of the Black Lives Matter movement to the broader and deeper investments that need to be made that you were talking about earlier if we're really gonna do something about the roots of the problem. One uh, concern or criticism I've read coming from folks who I think are um, uh, supportive of the ultimate goal is that the focus on those things, though, could could take the attention away from things like economic opportunity. Even though there, even though you track the line in which they're related, to take some focus away from economic opportunity, food security, um, uh, affordable housing, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Well, I don't know how investments. you talk about any of those things without talking about mass incarceration okay. in poor communities of color. Because if you want to talk about food insecurity, then you have to talk about people who are released 
from prison and have nowhere to go, have, have no money, uh, have difficulty finding a job, um, you know, find themselves in situations where they're often barred from public housing even, and have to bounce around friends, couches, different homes. Um, many people find themselves, you know, living on the street or in shelters, um, and often they find themselves very vulnerable even once they do um, obtain a job because uh, sometimes they do so only because they fail to check the box on an employment application. And if that ever you know, comes to light, they could immediately be dismissed. Um, and uh, the kinds of jobs that are often available to people who have criminal records of any kind um, are generally of a much, you know, on a lower pace scale um, with less opportunity for mobility. Um, it can be difficult for people to even get access to higher education once they have a criminal record. Yeah. And so, you know, I think, again, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I hoped that people would begin to think about mass incarceration, not only in terms of its relationship to our racial history, but also begin to think of it as not simply as a problem of who is locked in a, you know, a cage at any particular moment in time. If you take a snapshot you know, of our prison and jail system, you can say, oh, we have a couple of million people um, behind bars at any moment in time. But that ignores the fact that you have double that number of people um, on probation, on correctional, under correctional control, and over 70 million people who have a criminal record that authorizes legal discrimination against them for the rest of their lives. And that you know, roughly a quarter of the people who find themselves in prison or jail at any particular moment will churn back through the system in you know very short order, often within the same year. And within three years, you know, the majority of those who have been in prison will be back again. And this kind of system in which people who are poor, um, people who are people, folks of color are far more likely to be in the system, um, creates a situation that for some communities, it is impossible to talk about economic security, educational opportunity, how to feed your family without also dealing with the reality that you, your brother, your uncle, your aunt, people are cycling in and out of prison pretty much all the time. There's a wonderful organization called SE Justice Group that is based in LA, but has become a national organization. It's uh, an organization created by and for women who are impacted by mass incarceration. And by this, I don't mean people who have simply been locked up. <laughs> but people who are impacted by mass incarceration primarily because they have loved ones behind bars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one in four women today have a loved one currently locked up. One in two black women have a loved one who's currently behind bars. And what that means <laughs> is that not only are they dealing with the emotional grief, um, trying to keep families together, but very often are faced with the economic challenge of trying to you know, rally money for bail, try to find money to pay for lawyers. When people are released from prison or jail, trying to support them and to feed them and to house them when they have nowhere else to go. Um, and so the economics of mass incarceration itself um, are such that I think it is just impossible mm. to talk about economic equity in poor communities and communities of color without placing mass incarceration um, at the center mm. of that conversation. So I just, two, two more questions for you, and I wanna look now to your current work, your current project, and you told a very interesting story at 
at, at lunch about how you came to your newer work. Um, so I wonder if you could relate a little bit of that and, and tell us about this new project that you're beginning to think about and beginning to put together. Yeah, so I was talking at lunch about the fact that I actually have abandoned law. <laughs> um, I, you know, decided, um, you know, at some point, not only after several years of being on the road nonstop, trying to sound the alarm about mass incarceration while I had three young kids at home and becoming enormously just exhausted and drained and um, a little bit hopeless. Um, you know, I, even as Ferguson was erupting and these movements were being born, I was really struggling with this kind of loss of faith that, uh, we were ever going to figure out a way, not just to end mass incarceration, but to overcome the politics of white supremacy in America. And... I think a lot of it had to do with just the fatigue and exhaustion of having worked so many years as a civil rights lawyer and then writing the book and being on the road constantly with dealing with young children and having this sense at the very moment where it seemed like the world was waking up, I was having a sinking feeling that things weren't actually going to change. And um, it's, I started really struggling with these questions of is it not just a matter of imagining that an, another world is possible, but do we need to find another way towards the world we aim to co-create? And uh, I was so frustrated with the legal policy reform conversations and hopeful um, with the new movements that were being born, but finding that I no longer wanted to participate as a lawyer um, in these spaces. And so I quit law, uh, left the legal academy and began teaching at Union Theological Seminary, which is a seminary in New York City that really kind of has at the core of its mission, the intersection of spirituality and justice, and became interested in liberation movements and kind of wrestling with the question of not just what must we do, um, but really like who must we become to rise to the challenges of our time and what are the resources that are available to us? Spiritual resources from all different faith traditions, indigenous traditions, um, movements for liberation around the world that can help um, really to restore my own faith <laughs> in a way. Um, but to think more creatively about what it means to build um, or what's required of us as we build um, truly transformational revolutionary movements in the United States and around the world. And so I began teaching at Union Theological Seminary and then at some point realized, actually, I need to be a student. <laughs> um, and so I enrolled. Um, we moved two years ago out here and I enrolled as a student at Union. And um, it's been a bit of a wild journey to switch seats from <laughs> professor to student. Um, but yeah, I'm very much interested um, in um, really kind of the spiritual dimension of liberation work and um, thinking as we were discussing at our lunch today about um, not just reimagining what justice is, but really reimagining what it means to be in community with each one another as we are working and striving for justice and what's required of us during these times. So I'm in school and I've also been working on a book on and off for several years now. It's finally with the publisher, which is very different than the first. It's much more of a memoir that reflects on the racial and political awakenings um, that I've experienced, but also why I've come to believe that we need not just a political revolution, but really a spiritual awakening um, in order to actually make the 
other world that we dream of possible and um, be who we need to be uh, in these times. Well, it sounds like it's going to be another big book. So, yeah. Well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> well, here's my last question. It's um, it's for our students. Um, a lot of the students who are here today are studying issues about race and inequality, and uh, many of them want to work in ways to advance racial justice. So, do you have any advice for them at this stage of their lives? Well, I, I, I guess I, one of the things I would say is the sooner you can abandon careerism, the better. Um, I feel like I had to learn that the hard way, you know, when I... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can have a career, but careerism to me is being more committed to your career than you are to the values around which you want your life to be guided by. And so for me, it was very difficult to leave Stanford Law School. Um, mm -hmm. They hadn't tenured a black woman professor on the faculty yet, and there was sort of this idea like, you could be the one, you know? Um, <laughs> and, you know, there was this idea that somehow moving up within the system was somehow a value in itself that was worth striving for. And um, it's easy to kind of become attached to those ideas um, because they feel good. Like this idea, oh, look, I can make a contribution <laughs> by moving up in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I really think that that is dangerous. I think it's it's dangerous spiritually for your own <laughs> um, your own self. But I think it's it, it's dangerous to our movements and to our communities to be uh, seeking power or status um, at the expense of telling the truth when you need it. We know it needs to be told um, or. Um, acting in ways that you know will um, invite reproach um, or exclusion or condemnation. And so that was very difficult for me, but at the same time, it was far away the best decision I ever made. And walking away from the law again, you know, it was such a strange thing. What are you doing? Why are you leaving the law? Like, you could do whatever, you know, as a lawyer and within legal academy. And I think getting to a point where you become guided by something much greater than just a desire to kind of make it within your field, whatever that might want to be, um, is important. And um, it can also be scary. I think especially, you know, in times like today where speaking up, speaking the truth, um, can, you know, get you canceled in various ways. We see this right now with students, you know, courageously speaking up, calling for a ceasefire, calling, you know, for recognition, um, of the suffering of Palestinian people. Um, you, you can have, there are real risks involved and it can be scary, especially if you feel like you're facing these risks alone. But I would say that the best advice is, you know, to try to live your life speaking your truth <laughs> with courage, um, but also living with compassion, um, compassion for yourself and compassion for the people you think of as your adversaries. Um, you know, as I said at the outset of my book, I was on the wrong side of some of these issues for a long time, and I'm probably still on the wrong side of some issues. Um, I'm a work in progress, learning as I go, and we all are. And so I think it's very important if you're gonna do racial justice work, um, to do it as courageously as you can, as honestly as you can, but with as much compassion and courage um, for yourself and others as possible. Thanks. So um, we're gonna open it up now and see what questions and comments you have. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I, I see a hand go up, but I'm gonna exercise, again, 
the director going out for the last time, one prerogative. There's a couple here that has come to every single one of our talks since I have been doing this, except when they travel out of town. So I'm going to give the first question to them. Uh, Diana Biro and Eric Rogers. I don't know between the two of you who want to ask the first question. But I'm going to put you on the spot. So you have the first question and we'll go from there. So Jackie, bring the microphone over there. They've come to every single one. <laughs> Congratulations on the series and Thanks. all the work that you put in on it. Thanks. Your last comments were on spirituality. <laughs> and um, from my observation, and I'm certainly no expert, there seems to be a diminishing amount of spirituality in this country. Do you see that? And do you see any, any causes for optimism? Did you say you see diminishing spirituality? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I don't see it that exactly that way. I mean, there's certainly a lot of evidence from Gallup polls that people are leaving, um, you know, they're leaving churches, leaving traditional forms of religion. But I don't know that people are actually... Um, becoming less spiritual. I think they are um, less inclined um, to accept the teachings of traditions in which they have been raised and less likely to see themselves, locate themselves within one particular religious institution. But um, I myself don't identify with one, any one particular religious tradition. I see wisdom, truth, beauty in all faith traditions and also problems. Um, and I think that, you know, the faith traditions um, that have sustained so many <laughs> liberation movements in the United States and around the world um, are vital and important and that there is an enormous amount to be learned from them. And I think that it may well be that new forms of what we think of as religion broad, broadly defined um, may emerge as more and more people are interested um, more in spirituality that aligns with their values um, than in you know, necessarily finding themselves within one particular tradition. So I don't, I, I would, I'm not experiencing a concern about the decline in spirituality, even though I recognize that there are declining numbers in traditional religious institutions. So um, person in the pink shirt here, I saw a hand up go up and then um, we'll get someone from that. We'll get this person right here. After, after, yeah, we'll go two at a time. So Sylvester, just wait and then we'll go. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name Hi. is Adia Santos. I will get through this question quickly, I promise. <laughs> my father bought me this book when I was 10 years old and it took him six months to sit through it with me line by line, chapter by chapter and evaluate everything just so I would understand all of it. <laughs> wow. I still can't get my kids to read it, so. <laughs> so I'm I impressed. Quote, radicalize us from a very young age. I've been going to white institutions pretty much my entire life, so that posed a challenge for him as I grew up. But um, um, I've been here for a few years. I'm now a graduate student, but I, I was here since my freshman year. During my freshman year, I was a part of an organization or movement that whose primary goal was to challenge the university's position on how the carceral system and policing system in the city is perpetuated on our campus. Mm -hmm. So I cannot express the amount of gratitude I have to be able to literally just speak in front of you right now. Mm -hmm. um, I promised myself I wouldn't get emotional, so I won't, but <laughs> I've carried this work throughout everything I've done since I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So while I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity, it's not, it's not lost on me where we're sitting. Mm -hmm. And the fact that our university has a lot to do when it comes to a lot of the things that you reference in your work. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question, not to reiterate the question that was just asked, but would be, how would you advise <laughs> those of us that consider ourselves to be like student leaders or student activists 
handle the cognitive dissonance that's required to be in an institution that perpetuates some of these oppressive systems, but also know we need to do what we need to do to graduate. Mm. Yeah, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. And I don't think I can give a blanket answer not knowing the specific challenges that might be faced in that part. But, you know, I do think that, and it sounds like, I gather from what you've said that you are likely already involved in efforts not only to educate yourself about what is actually happening, um, on this campus and outside of it in terms of policing or other ways in which kind of the carceral, carceral logics are being, um, you know, replicated. Um, but I, yeah, absolutely organizing um, to change what you find that is absolutely unjust and that you cannot tolerate and every person has to make choices for themselves about the level of risk they're willing to tolerate. And I, I can't, I can't, I can't make those choices for anyone. Um, but I would just say really lean into the discomfort, you know, and to, instead of just, you know, reflexively playing it safe, um, challenging yourself to see how far you can go. And, you know, we all have to make choices. I mean, when I was in, when I was clerking um, on Supreme Court, I was two years out of law school. Um, my father died suddenly of a heart attack. I was planning to be a public defender, a civil rights lawyer, hadn't quite made up my mind yet. He died of a heart attack. Um, my family had no money, you know, like none. He left us some debt and that was our inheritance. And um, my mother was, you know, I, it, we went through a very difficult time and I came to realize that like, oh, I need to go make some money. I need to figure out how to help keep my mom in a house. I need to help her figure out what she's gonna do. And I can't just with all of my student loan debt and everything else go live on nothing. Like I have a responsibility. And so I went to a corporate firm, Hogan and Hartson in Washington DC. And I lasted 11 months <laughs> before I quit and got out of there. But those 11 months paid me well enough that well I could months. set some financial things straight and, you know, with a kind of clear conscience, then go on and do the work that I most wanted to do. And I just offer that, which is to say that, yeah, sometimes we have to make choices that we wouldn't otherwise want to make. And we're not always able to do the pure thing politically that we most would want to. And and um, I'm the last person to point fingers and judge, but I always encourage people to kind of challenge themselves um, to um, not just do what feels safe or feel comfortable and to see what they can reasonably risk. Um, and uh, I think it's often a lot more than we imagine. So this person down here, I think, Sylvester, but before that person gets the microphone, I just want to say my job in the reception is going to make sure that you get a picture. <laughs> She's talking to her friend. You, 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 I'm talking to you. I'm going to make sure you get a picture with her. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, my name is Michelle. Um, I'm a MPA, MAIR graduate student. Um, but before that, I was a former educator, so I was teaching in middle school for a while. And I think that there's something that needs to be said about the school to prison pipeline that's mm -hmm. happening. Yes. And as an educator, I could see post pandemic how it was very tough on behavior and it's moving pre like after the pandemic, you could see a movement towards more relationship based disciplinary practices in school. However, you could also see that some schools are resisting to that practice, mm -hmm. um, which can lead into the school to prison pipeline. What advice or, yeah, what advice do you have for those educators in local communities who don't have the resources um, to properly educate their students mm -hmm. um, to combat that school to prison pipeline, but also as a former educator trying to go back into education equity 
what can we also do? Because the school to prison pipeline also leads into mass incarceration. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. So there are some really wonderful resources now available around restorative justice in schools. Um, my kids actually attend a high school where there's a restorative justice program that students participate in. Um, and they address a wide range of issues that arise um, on the campus, but they exist in many different forms all over the country. And I know the Advancement Project is one, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Advancement Project, but um, I believe their website will point you to a lot of resources around combating the school to prison pipeline um, on campuses and also point you in the direction of resources for restorative justice. Um, you know, I think especially when it comes to young people um, in middle schools and in high schools, learning that there are alternative ways of responding to harm besides just a purely punitive one is so vital and inviting students into the process of thinking about what you know, um, alternative responses to harm can look like and you know, uh, being creative, being invited into that creative process is enormously important and there are resources out there for you. So I hope you'll, you'll take a look. Yeah. I'm gonna see this hand here and this one right here. We'll get these two folks, go ahead. Hi, oh, oh. Um, it's so nice to meet you. Your work has been very informative in my own education. Um, my name is Shania and I'm a second year doc student in the sociology department here. Um, and I am interested in the sociology of punishment looking at race and reentry. So I really wanted to ask you, um, what do you perceive as the role of the academy in enhancing and uplifting the voices of abolitionists, of people who do, for example, um, transformative work in their communities? Because sometimes, or oftentimes, um, ac academics can kind of obscure those voices that are actually doing on the groundwork. Yeah, well, you know, I, I hope that, you know, every university has a course on abolition, right? And it can be a course that begins with, you know, the work of abolitionists around slavery and traces the work of abolitionists to the present day. I mean, a course like that would be a fantastic, and they do exist. So I'm not acting like this is like inventing the wheel. They exist, and there's syllabi and models that exist all over the country. But courses like that are inherently interdisciplinary, and, um, you know, they can be framed as, you know, with, through a historical lens, through a sociological lens, through, um, you know, a race lens. There's many ways, depending on the nature of the professor and what their field of interest in. The, you know, there's many different lenses that can be brought to it in ways. But I would hope that the work of abolitionists, um, you know, from the founding of our country to the present day would be understood and treated as a very important and legitimate subject of study, um, as well as practice. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, you know, um, Mary Paba, I think, has really valuable resources. You're going to Interrupting Criminalization. Their website, I believe, has important resources. I'm trying to think, has anybody gathered syllabi specifically around abolition? And I'm sure somebody has. I just can't point you to the, um, to the best resource on that. But um, absolutely. And then, of course, hosting forums and supporting um, you know, invitations to people who are abolitionists or who are writing um, about that work, I think would be very valuable. I think there's so much misperception even around what abolition is as a result of very skewed um, kind of propaganda and mis disinformation around abolition and defund the police and all of that. And so, uh, inviting and encouraging and supporting serious study of it, um, I think it'd be highly worthwhile for any institution. So you can just pass the microphone or Sylvester can take it to the next person. Maybe before we get that question, um, Michelle, it might make sense 
be just to share with all of us a real quick thumbnail definition of what abolitionism means to you. What it, you know, what what does that mean in the current current context? Abolitionist. Well, I think a lot of people would define it differently. I'll say why. I have found personally abolition to be so important as not just like a uh, concept as in like what is the definition of the term, but rather as a framework for kind of reimagining um, what our work can potentially be about. Okay. So abolition is not simply, I think many people, and you know, it's a limitation of you know, language. Abolition is not simply about, oh, let's just tear down all the prisons or abolish all the police. No, abolition is about doing the work of movement and community building that make police and prisons utterly unnecessary mm -hmm. to any society, right? So when you think about it in those terms, like what would it look like to create a world, a society, a community in which prisons and police are not only unnecessary, but also like unthinkable in the same way that today we can kind of look at things like, oh, slavery is unthinkable. Oh, chopping off people's hands when they steal is unthinkable. Like we could get to a place um, where we could imagine, oh, locking somebody in a cage and dehumanizing them is unthinkable, something that we would never do. What kind of world would we create? What kind of communities would be necessary um, in which policing and prisons was not the response to harm, to suffering, to poverty, Etc. And um, that challenge of kind of reimagining, like how we respond to the very problems that exist in our society, that we reflexively respond to policing and with policing and prisons. Are there alternative ways of responding to this? What would it require of us? That exercise, I think, is enormously important. Mm -hmm. And I think once you really begin taking abolition seriously, you suddenly start realizing like, oh, wow. Are there other ways of responding to someone having a mental health crisis in front of their apartment building than calling the police? Oh, yeah, actually, there's lots of other ways we could respond to people having a mental health crisis. Are there other ways we could respond to people who, you know, are unhoused or sleeping on park benches and rather than having the police respond? Yes, yes, there's ways. Could we respond to drug abuse, drug addiction? Yes, there's other ways we can do this. And you keep going and suddenly like, oh, are there other ways of responding to things like violence? And you start thinking, okay, well, let's start talking about different kinds of violence. Not all violence is the same. You begin this exercise and you suddenly begin to realize that so many of the things that we reflexively respond to with punitiveness and punishment and imagine that there's no alternative, there are alternatives. And we could create um, communities and um, a world in which we respond differently and where these kinds of harmful, often brutal <laughs> institutions um, are not only unnecessary, but unthinkable. And for me, that is helpful, inspiring, and generative. And um, I I'm, I'm, would love to see much more of that work and thinking not only within the academy, <laughs> but in our communities, in our faith communities, in our churches, in our you know, um, high school and elementary schools, so that we begin practicing. How do we respond to harm, middle schoolers, having a tantrum in a classroom? How could we respond beside kicking the kid out of school? What are the alternatives? And uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful um, about abolition as a framework and a practice um, for responding to harm and imagining that it's possible to create communities that don't need them and um, a public that will once regret having them. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Sonia Issa. I'm a senior studying political science and project management with a minor in African American studies. Um, and one, just thank you for coming here and talking to us. Mm -hmm. um, I became familiar with your work through um, peer led court diversion work in my hometown of Brooklyn, New York. Um, and we use that just as um, practice. We did circle keeping work. Um, we used your book to, I guess, kind of start imagining, but I kind of wanted to men like, I guess pinpoint, you brought, you mentioned a lot about imagining and reimagination and how that may limit or expand the ways that we think about carceral um, and punitive systems. And I'm just curious to know about how you imagine holistic systems of accountabilities, especially within under-resourced, disenfranchised communities like mine. Mm, that's a great question. And you know, I don't have like, if I'd figured it out already, I would have written that book, so. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I think that, you know, having spent a lot of time thinking kind of at the macro level of massive crisis of mass incarceration and its relationship to these, you know, political forces and dynamics that have been recycling throughout our US history. I think that in recent years, I've become much more interested really kind of like in the question of like, what do we do in my school to change the way we respond to harm and to prevent someone from going into the system. Um, that we may not be able to say, well, here's this grand new accountability system that does not perpetuate cycles of harm and is non-punitive in nature. But I think it becomes like easier when we start kind of taking it more at a local level, at a community level, and begin thinking about how we respond to particular kinds of problems of harm in new ways. And that's why I gave the examples that I did, because I may not be able to articulate the grand theory of everything in terms of systems of accountability. But when we start thinking about the kinds of things that sweep people into the systems, you know, most frequently, there are a wide range of other potential responses. Um, so, you know, I have received some criticism for the fact that the book focuses, you know, primarily on nonviolent offenses, you know, especially drug offenses. And I think that criticism is valid. But the reason I focused on that is because I wanted to make clear that the overwhelming majority of people who cycle in and out of our prisons and jails are not the people who we imagine that prisons and jails are even built for, right? So it, it was to show that these trying to show that these institutions aren't really functioning to respond to the problem of crime, but are really functioning as systems of racial and social control. Um, you know, it remains the case that like 95% of all police arrests that occur every year are for relatively minor nonviolent offenses. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about the people who commit violent crimes, but it's to kind of put into perspective what these institutions are actually doing. Police are not out there solving murders every day. That's not what they're doing. That's not what they're doing with their time. You know, they're sweeping the streets and harassing homeless people and they're, you know, pulling people over and rifling through their cars in search of there's the kind of routine police activity in poor communities and poor communities of color that go on every day and that swipe sweep thousands, you know, well, millions of people into cages every year. Um, is activity we can do entirely without. And when you really begin to, to kind of see how the systems are functioning in that way, you don't necessarily need the grand theory of everything. You can begin asking yourself, how do we respond to mental health crises different? How do we respond to the problem of um, shoplifting differently? How do we respond to these things in ways that are not purely punitive, that do not wind up with putting people in cage, and yet still, um, are responding to the problem of, of real harm. It's not turning away from the, the fact that people do create harm, but asking the question why and asking what all their alternatives might exist for responding to it. I will say, because I don't want to dodge the real problem of violence that exists in these communities, that there's a wonderful book by Danielle Sered 
and the title is now going to, what is it? Until we reckon, violence, mass incarceration, and the road to repair. Thank you. Um, that deals squarely with this question of how do we respond meaningfully to violence um, without just more violence, right? And um, interestingly, in that book, she reports on the experience of a uh, restorative justice program in New York City called Common Justice, where people who are victims of violent offenses are given the choice, this is in Brooklyn, given the choice of do you want to, you know, proceed with the traditional criminal justice route and lock them up and throw away a key? Or would you prefer to pursue a restorative justice approach um, in which you will um, be in conversation with the person who caused you harm and participate in a process of figuring out what justice might look like for you and them? And I, I can't remember the exact statistics, it was like close to like 90% of pe victims, survivors, of violent crime chose the restorative justice option rather than choosing the traditional lock them up and throw away the key. And this was like shocking to people, like because we assume if you're a victim of violence and you automatically want the person locked up. And in sharing the interviews with the people who chose the restorative justice route, they said, well, we know that the people we send away are gonna come back to our community and they're gonna come back worse off, and they'll probably come back with a grudge against me or my family. And I actually don't want to perpetuate the cycles of harm. I'm not actually wishing harm on them. I want it to stop. And I want there to be some acknowledgement of the harm that I've suffered. I want resources for my own healing, and I wanna make sure they don't do it again. And so there are models um, like common justice, even with respect to the worst forms of violence um, that have been proven um, to be more effective <laughs> than simply tossing people in cages and imagining that we've accomplished something. So um, it isn't a grand theory of accountability, but um, I hope it helps. <laughs> so we have two more questions and then we have a little ceremony we have to do at the end. So let's see this person at the top here and we'll get this gentleman over here. So go ahead, Sylvester, and go up there and then we'll go over here. Up the, there we go, yeah, that was the hand I saw first anyway, sorry. Hello, um, my name is Toyin Green. Um, I'm a sophomore, I'm studying health humanities and political philosophy. So I had a little question. Um, I know you talked earlier about becoming hopeless about um, justice, especially with the sense of fatigue surrounding your efforts. Um, in a world today where genocide is widely supported, um, global, social, political, and economic inequality is continuously upheld, and voices are systemically silenced, and unity among the oppressed is really hard to come by. Um, how would you suggest people my age, um, how would you suggest they overcome the sense of hopelessness in ways that allow us to take this um, inevitable burden of taking care of ourselves um, while simultaneously fighting for others in a necessary and radical way. Wow. <laughs> in five minutes or less. <laughs> that is such an important question and I don't have a pat answer for it. I'll tell you where I am with it right now because it changes. Um, but I think where I am with it right now is that I've come to see that for me, meaning, purpose, and joy in my life come from doing work and being involved in movements and creative projects for the liberation of all. Um, that that's where like meaning and purpose come from for me. And I came to a point where I realized that I would still do this work even if I knew for sure we would lose in the end, right? Even if I knew for sure. And um, so I think, you know, we don't know. We don't know what's gonna happen. And we don't know how any of this will turn out for sure. Um, there's this wonderful theologian who, you know, that I 
been reading recently who kind of coined this term pessimistic hope. And his way of defining pessimistic hope is different than my way of defining pessimistic hope. But the way I think of pessimistic hope is having this really clear-eyed like sense that the odds are stacked against us. That if you're gonna be realistic in your assessment, it doesn't look good. The odds don't look good. It's actually, you can even say it's unlikely that America will be born again in the way that one might hope, that it's unlikely. But I also know that people working creatively for liberation have again and again and again made the impossible possible and found ways to make a way out of no way. Over and over again, like miracles happen. People make miracles all the time in ways that you can't predict. And so I think for me, pessimistic hope is being honest and not pretending that, oh, you know, the, arc of moral, the moral arc of the universe is just gonna bend towards justice, we gotta give it another tug and we'll definitely get there. Having a clear-eyed, even kind of pessimistic view is unlikely, but like I get meaning, I get purpose, I get joy from being in struggle with others and I will do it no matter what and I know it's against the odds, but like I ain't going out without putting up some kind of fight. <laughs> Go ahead. Yep. Uh, you have How the last you question. Go ahead. Um, how are you doing? My name is Michael Willacy. Um, I was actually incarcerated when I mm -hmm. came across this book. Um, in the first edition of your book, you had you had a part in the back of your book where you said to start study groups. Mm -hmm. So in some Wanga Correctional Facility, we actually had a study group. Oh, good. Um, working in human resources with a um, couple of individuals that are also working in human resources in the community now, I told them that I was, that I was coming to see you today and they were like, what, are you serious? <laughs> um, but I, I just wanted to ask you, um, I wanted to thank you um, for helping me reconnect, telling our story, mm -hmm. and helping me reconnect with my humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was um very good. It was it was a good thing for us. In it. Um, your book was like helped me reconnect with you know my you know Christian values. Um, you know, community values and family values, and um, we changed my life. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you for sharing that, and thank you for being here. I'm you're so welcome. glad you're, you're here. Welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, but um, I definitely got bragging rights over all the guys that were <laughs> in the study group with me. They're out in the community doing well as well. Okay, so so two pictures now. <laughs> two pictures. All right, thank you. Thank uh, you. Well, this has been fantastic. Your questions have been amazing. Michelle Alexander, you've been amazing, inspirational. I've heard, I guess if I had to put two words on what I've heard for the last hour and a half, I, I've been hearing a lot of faith and love is what I've been hearing. And, and in addition to clear-eyed understanding. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's been inspirational. Thank you. We have a little ceremony here. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, oh, you're, you're always one step ahead of me. Um, so we have a little ceremony. We, we, we have a tradition that is attached to, uh, I better not drop this. We, we have a tradition that is attached to this lecture series that the lecturer gets uh, this bowl that is made by a local artist. Whoops, sorry. Um, there I go. Uh, in Scanny Atlas, it's hand-blown uh, glass. And of course, it's an SU color scheme. Uh, snake oil glass works and scanning atlas and the mm -hmm. artist is Lorraine Austin and so we don't expect you to take this back with you we will make sure that it makes it back to you thank safely, you it's but, beautiful but it's thank you beautiful. thank you again for being yeah. with us and it was our pleasure thank you thank you thank you all thank you